In this video, we're going to examine the cost of capital, which is the cost to a firm for raising the cash it needs to buy supplies, pay workers, and purchase equipment and property. We'll start by discussing the various names for the cost of capital, and then break down the components of the cost of capital. The two primary components we'll examine are the cost of equity and the cost of debt. Once we've discussed the components, we'll estimate the cost of capital. Now, throughout these videos, you've heard me refer to a couple of rates like the yield to maturity or the rate of return, the discount rate, the interest rate, the cost of equity. I'm sure that's gotten a bit tiresome. These rates mean different things to different people. For the purposes of today's discussion, I want you to think of yourself as the owner of a company that needs cash. As a business owner, you would be interested in all of these rates that we've mentioned throughout the course, but most of them, like the required return or the yield to maturity, are only a component of your cost of capital, aka your discount rate. Your cost of capital is the percentage cost you have to pay to any lender or shareholder that provides you with money. Later in this video, we'll start talking about the best measure of the discount rate or the cost of capital, and that's called the Weighted Average Cost of Capital, or WACC. This measure takes the percentage of capital you receive by both issuing debt and equity and calculates the average return lenders and shareholders demand in compensation for giving up their capital to you for a period of time. Now, there's a lot of reasons why we care about calculating the cost of capital, but I'll give you two of the most important reasons right now. First, the cost of capital is going to vary dramatically from firm to firm. Some risky firms, or firms that have really volatile cash flows, are going to have a very high cost of capital, since banks likely won't want to lend to these firms. If a bank does lend to a risky firm, the bank will likely charge a high interest rate. This means a lot of startup companies or tech companies uh, typically prefer to issue stock. Stockholders typically expect a higher return than bondholders. A manager would certainly want to know how much it's going to cost to raise another dollar of capital. The second reason we're talking about the cost of capital is because if we're valuing a firm, the cost of capital is going to be the best discount rate we can use. The reason we want to use the cost of capital, which takes into account both stock returns and interest rates the firm is paying to its lenders, is because a lot of firms are going to use both methods for raising cash. Just using the interest rate on the firm's bonds as a firm's discount rate is not appropriate. There are a couple of components to the cost of capital. The first is the cost of equity. This is the return that investors expect to earn if they buy your company's shares. We sometimes call the cost of equity the required return because it's what investors are requiring in order to buy shares. If investors don't get this return on their investment, they'll likely want to sell their shares, which will cause the share price to fall and the value of your company to correspondingly fall. The second component of the cost of capital is the yield on debt, or the cost of debt. There are several types of debt that a firm can use. It can borrow from a bank and make regular interest payments, and it can also issue bonds to investors. Those bonds will have a yield to maturity and likely a yield to call. The yield on those bonds, or the interest rate on the bank debt, will be our cost of debt. Finally, some firms issue preferred stock. In a previous video, I defined preferred stock. The rate of return on the preferred stock is our cost of preferred stock, although we're not going to factor it into our weighted average cost of capital in this video because, quite frankly, a small percentage of firms actually have preferred stock outstanding. Now, the final point I'll note here is that our cost of capital represents an average cost to our firm of raising capital. We want it to represent the cost if the firm were to issue new capital immediately. This means we always want to use the most forward-looking or recent measure of each component. As we go on, I'll show you why this is so important. Here are the costs of capital for four well-known companies as of March 2019. They represent the cost of each company raising new capital, or cash, for operations. The higher the discount rate, the more costly it is to issue debt or equity. Here, Netflix's weighted average cost of capital is the highest. This is partially due to Netflix having a higher required or expected return than the others. Goldman Sachs, on the other hand, issues a very high amount of debt relative to the amount of equity it's issued. Uh, so that high amount of debt 
pushes its WACC downward because because the yield to maturity on debt is often far lower than the expected return on equity. Now, I keep mentioning the WACC, or Weighted Average Cost of Capital, so let's define it formally. The WACC is the cost of capital that is weighted based on the amount of debt and equity a firm has issued. As I mentioned earlier, it's a forward-looking measure. This means that it's our best prediction of the average cost to the firm if the firm were to issue new capital today in the same weights of debt and equity it has already issued. We're going to calculate this directly, and to do that, we'll need to use a lot of market information to ensure our measure is as forward-looking as possible. Now let's take a look at the formula for the WACC. As you can see here, the WACC incorporates the cost of debt and the cost of equity, here referred to as RD and RE respectively. We multiply each of these by the percentage of the firm's capital that they represent. Now let's talk about each of them in turn, and then we'll discuss the other components you see here. The cost of equity is really the return required by equity investors given the risk of the cash flows from the firm. This is why we sometimes call it the required return when we're doing valuation work. There are two primary ways to measure the cost of equity. The first is the dividend growth model that we covered a couple of lectures ago. The other method is the capital asset pricing model, which we also used in that same lecture. Let's review each of these. The dividend growth model assumes that our firm's dividends grow by the same percentage every year. We refer to the percentage growth rate in dividends as G. D1 in this equation is the dividend the firm is expected to pay one year from now. D0 is the dividend paid today. R sub E is our variable representing the cost of equity and P sub zero is the price of the stock today. If we can assume that the firm's dividends grow by the same amount every year or every quarter, we should be able to rearrange the dividend growth model to solve for the cost of equity. Let's take a look at an example. So in this example, your company is expected to pay a dividend of $1.25 per share next year. That's our dividend in year one. And we're going to assume that our dividends will grow at a rate of 5% per year. That's actually quite large. And we know that our P0 here, our current stock price is $12 and six cents. Now we're going to use the dividend growth model and rearrange it so that we have our RE equal to the dividend in year one divided by the price in year zero plus our growth rate. This is just a formula you should know off the top of your head, really. Uh, but end result, we're taking 125 divided by 12.06, adding in 5%, and that'll give us our expected or required return of 15.36%. So this model is telling us that we, as the manager of a company or the owner of a company, we should really expect that investors are going to require our firm to offer a 15.36% return. Otherwise, they're likely to sell their shares. There's one big advantage of the dividend growth model. It's easy. It's easy to understand and it's easy to use. However, it's often not reliable because most firms don't pay regular dividends or they don't pay dividends that grow at the same rate through time. If you don't have a dividend or some other cash flow to measure, this model is going to be pretty close to worthless. This model is also extremely sensitive to the dividend growth rate that you assume. Let's take a look at a case where we have a dividend but are unsure of the dividend growth rate. In this example, our dividend payout grows at different rates. In 2016, the growth rate of Ford's dividend was 108%. However, in previous years, the dividend growth rate was far lower. This is a common occurrence in the real world. Sometimes, firms make large one-time dividend payouts. In this case, a 108% growth rate can't be sustained. Even if we take the average dividend growth rate over the period, that's still 36%. If I'm valuing Ford and looking for a model to use to calculate the cost of equity, I would not be using the dividend growth model. The second method of estimating the cost of equity is the CAPM. This equation takes the return on a long-term U.S. Treasury, like a 10-year T-note, as the risk-free rate and adds to it the firm's beta multiplied by the difference between the expected return on the S&P 500 and the risk-free rate. Remember, this difference between the expected return on the S&P 500 and the risk-free rate is what we call our market risk premium. 
we often set this somewhere between 5% and 7%. The beta of the stock is the measure of the systematic risk of the firm's stock. If you recall, we actually calculated this a couple of lectures ago. Now, let's take a look at how we would calculate the expected return on the stock using the CAPM in the real world. So, let's assume that the historical market risk premium, the return on the S&P 500 annually minus the yield on the 10-year T-note is 6%. And we know that Ford's beta is 1.13%, which it was a couple of years ago. And we'll say that the rate on a 30-year T bond is 3%. What is Ford's cost of equity using the CAPM? Well, we're going to be using the CAPM equation. So risk-free rate plus beta times market risk premium. And our risk-free rate is always our yield on the T note or T bond or some other treasury. Here in this example, we're using a T bond, but some people prefer to use T notes or even a T bill on occasion. And our beta, that's just given as 1.13. If we wanted to, we could calculate that directly ourselves. And our market risk premium, that's the entire thing inside the parentheses. So all we have to do is plug and chug, and we find that our cost of equity, or return on equity, or expected return, whatever you want to call it, is 9.78%. This tells us that investors who are using this model are expecting to earn a 9.78% return on this stock. If they don't get it, they might actually start selling their shares. There are several advantages of the CAPM. First, it accounts for the market or systematic risk of a stock. It also allows us to use very basic information that we can pull from Yahoo Finance or any other financial website. However, there are some drawbacks. The first is that you have to estimate the market risk premium. The value of the market risk premium is going to vary dramatically through time. So because of that, and because we can't directly observe the expected market risk premium, we often just put in the average market risk premium and maybe adjust it upward or downward by a percentage or two. There are also multiple ways to estimate the beta, which can result in some variation. Some people choose to use, say, 60 months of return data. Some people choose to use a year's worth of daily return data. There's other methods out there. Uh, but the beta is always calculated using historical data, which means that we're not necessarily using a forward-looking beta, which can be problematic. All right, now let's switch gears and talk about the drawbacks to estimating the cost of debt. I mentioned earlier that the cost of debt is the interest rate on the firm's debt, either bank debt or bonds. There are a couple of issues with this. Unlike the cost of equity, which can be estimated if the stock trades regularly, the cost of debt might only be determined at the time the bond is issued, since the bond might not be sold between the time it's issued and the time it matures. This means that the cost of debt might actually be an interest rate on the firm's bonds from a couple of years ago. Older bonds are sold through brokers on the secondary market. The secondary market consists of the over-the-counter market, including the NASDAQ, and stock exchanges such as the New York Stock Exchange. Most bonds are sold before maturity through the over-the-counter market. The OTC, or over-the-counter market, consists of hundreds of financial institutions and brokerages that buy and sell over, over the phone or via computer networks. Brokerage firms that deal in bonds have the latitude to set the prices for the bonds they sell. However, all prices are negotiable. Bonds sold on the OTC market are usually sold in amounts greater than $5,000 at a time. Now, because each firm might have issued multiple bonds that are outstanding right now, it might be the case that a firm has several different yields to maturity on each of its bonds. So, which bond's interest rate do you use when you're calculating the cost of debt? Also, if the bondholder sells their bonds to someone else on the secondary market, the yield on that bond might change because they can sell the bond for any price they want. So, we need a set of rules for identifying the ideal yield to use as our cost of debt. Remember, that I said we wanted to use the most forward-looking measure for our costs of debt and equity. Therefore, I have a couple of recommendations for you when you're selecting a cost of debt to use. The best measure of the cost of debt is the current yield to maturity on the firm's most recent bond issuance. 
However, if the firm's bonds aren't being traded, we would want to use the yield to maturity of the last bond issued by the firm. Finally, if it's unrealistic to use the yield to maturity of the last bond issued by the firm because, let's say, the firm is unlikely to issue a similar bond or its credit rating has just changed, uh, we can often use the weighted average yield to maturity of all the firm's existing debt issuances. I have here some data, and what we're going to do is we're going to essentially do what we did all the way back a couple of lectures ago when we calculated the yield to maturity on bonds. So in this example, we have a 30-year bond. It has a coupon rate of 4.25%. Coupons are paid semi-annually. Uh, the present value of this bond is $800, which means some investor bought this bond for $800, and the the par or face value is $1,000, just like most corporate bonds. What's our yield? All right, so our yield to maturity is going to incorporate all of that information. And so our face value, that's easy. That's always going to be 1,000 for a corporate bond. Our present value is negative 800, regardless of whether we're entering it in our BA2 calculator or in Excel. Our payment is going to be 1,000, just the par value, multiplied by our coupon rate of 4.25%, divided by 2 because we have semi-annual coupons. And that payment is going to be 21.25. So that's what we would enter into our BA2 calculator or in Excel. N, the number of payments, is going to be the number of years times number of payments annually, so 30 times 2. And finally, we're going to get our I divided by Y if we're calculating our yield via the BA2 calculator, or if we wanted to just calculate that in Excel, we'd get the same thing. And our I divided by Y here is 2.82. Now, remember, on your BA2 calculator, that's coming out in percentage terms. And because we're, cal we're assuming that each period is six months, we need to multiply that by two and divide it by 100 to get a percentage rate. So when we multiply that 2.82 by 2 and divide it by 100, we find that our yield to maturity, our YTM, is 5.64%. All right, now let's talk about another part of the WACC. This 1 minus T sub C stands for the marginal corporate tax rate the firm pays. We multiply it by the cost of debt and the firm's debt as a percentage of capital. There's a very specific reason we include this, and it's because of interest deductibility in the United States. All right, so let's talk about that interest tax deductibility. In the United States, any interest expense paid by the firm to its creditors is subtracted from the firm's taxable income. This means that the higher the interest expense, the lower the firm's tax rate. The amount by which the interest expense decreases the firm's tax liability is simply the amount of the interest expense multiplied by 1 minus the firm's marginal tax rate. We can also use the formula I have here to convert the firm's pre-tax cost of debt to an after-tax cost of debt. For example, if our marginal corporate tax rate is 22% and the pre-tax cost of debt is 4.5%, we multiply 4.5% by 1 minus 22% or 78%. This gives us an after-tax cost of debt of 3.51%. Now, let's talk about what I mean when I say the marginal tax rate. The marginal tax rate for a firm or an individual is just the top tax bracket that that firm or individual falls into. For example, here are the corporate tax rates for 2016. If we want to know what the marginal tax rate of a firm with taxable income of, let's say, $5 million is, all we need to do is find the bracket where that $5 million falls. So all we do is just look over here where it says if taxable income is between such and such, and we just look where $5 million falls. So that would be right here in this bracket, this bracket of 335001 to $10 million. And it looks like our marginal tax rate, which means the tax rate on that next dollar of income, is 34%. You might be wondering why I include this one minus the corporate tax rate in our weighted average cost of capital equation or why it's in here. Uh, the reason is because, well, it's it's really just, it was lobbied for. I mean, it, it really is as simple as that. And it's just a quirk of our system that we have to include in the weighted average cost of capital.
The final components of the WACC equation are the capital structure weights. E is the market value of the firm's equity, otherwise known as the firm's market cap. That's just the number of shares outstanding times the share price listed on the stock exchange. D is the market value of the firm's debt, though in reality we just take the total liabilities off the balance sheet. The reason we include the market value of equity and either the market value or book value of debt for a firm is because we need to calculate the weights of equity and debt in the firm. We take the market value of equity and divide by the market value of equity plus the market value of the firm's debt. This will give us the weight of the firm's equity as a percentage of total capital. We then divide the debt by the sum of debt plus equity, which will give us the weight of debt as a percentage of the firm's capital. Let's take a look at a WACC example using Ford's historical data. We'll calculate Ford's WACC as of a couple of years ago. So here we know all of our information and we're going to use it to calculate the WAC. Our cost of debt, like I said, is typically going to be the yield to maturity on Ford's most recent bond issuance, if possible. And that's going to be 4.97%. So it's paying its creditors 4.97% uh, return annually. The cost of equity, if we have the information available, we want to use the CAPM. And we already calculated Ford's cost of equity using the CAPM. That was 9.78%. Their marginal tax rate is simply the rate on their top tax bracket. And since Ford is or at, was at this point in time a very profitable company, that top tax bracket was 35%. Finally, we need the market value of Ford's debt and equity. And like I said earlier, the market value of Ford's debt is typically the going to be captured as the total liabilities on the firm's balance sheet. And you might ask, why is that? Well, it's simply because for a lot of firms, it's really hard to get an estimation of the market value of their debt. I mean, if their debt is not publicly traded, then quite frankly, we don't have that data. And for a lot of firms, most of their debt, the market value is going to be very close to the book value. So we typically just go ahead and take the total liabilities off the balance sheet and call it a day. And so in this case, the market value of Ford's debt at this point in time was $137.2 billion. Finally, the market value of Ford's equity was 12.06 times 4.03 billion shares and that'll give us their market cap of $48.61 billion. So we take our weighted average cost of capital equation, plug in our numbers for each of the components, and finally we get our WACC. So let's take a look at another real-world example, and the example I chose was Apple. Let's say you want to determine the WACC of Apple, and you know that the current market price of the 5.33 billion shares of Apple is currently $105.71. The firm has $194 billion in debt outstanding. Tax rate is 35%, and the yield on the equity and debt are 11.22% and 3.85%. Respectively, what is the weighted average cost of capital for Apple? All right, now let's work this problem in Excel. All right, so I already have the components that I need here. Let's pull that stuff out of this word problem. So our cost of equity here is given at 0. Point, well, it's already in percentage terms, so 11.22%. Our cost of debt is given as 3.85%. Our market value of equity is always going to be our market cap. And so that's just going to be our sh number of shares outstanding of 5.33 billion times our share price of 105.71. That looks about right. About half a billion dollars as of this point in time, or the point in time when I pulled the data. Our market value of debt is 194 billion. Our marginal tax rate is 35%. And now to get our WAC, we could just use the formula directly, but I often like to calculate the weight of debt and weight of equity 
first, just so our formula doesn't get too overwhelming. So our weight of debt is just going to be our market value of debt divided by the market value of debt plus the market value of equity, just our total capital. Next, our weight of equity is going to be our market value of equity divided by the market value of debt plus the market value of equity. So notice that these sum to 100%, as they always should. Now let's get our WAC. So our WAC is just going to be the product of our debt weight times the cost of debt times one minus our marginal tax rate. And we will add to that quantity the weight of equity times the cost of equity. And that will give us something. Well, let's go ahead and put that in percentage terms. So 8.99% is what I'm getting for Apple's weighted average cost of capital. So you can probably see why the weighted average cost of capital for Apple is a lot higher than for Ford. With Ford, we had a case where the company's cost of equity was a lot lower and they had a lot more debt or their debt percentage was a lot higher. All right, now let's get back to the lecture. And by get back to the lecture, I mean let's do one more final example to really hone in on this stuff. So in this example, we're essentially putting everything together. I'm going to ask you to calculate the whack of Microsoft given some real world data, and we have to do a few more calculations than we had to do in the previous two examples. So you're the CEO of Microsoft and you want to know the cost of capital. Microsoft has outstanding debt of 121.4 billion and a yield of 3.7%. Uh, the firm's 7.18 billion shares are traded at $58 and the firm has a beta of 1.16 and we'll assume the market risk premium and yield on the 30 year T-bond are 6%, 3% and corporate tax rate We'll assume that's the marginal tax rate is 35% again. All right, so let's work this problem in Excel. All right, so first things first, let's get our, we'll say our cost of equity. Actually, I will go over here and copy everything that we need just to save you guys a little time in this video. All right, so first let's get our cost of equity. We don't explicitly have a cost of equity in this problem, but given that we have the firm's beta market risk premium and the 30 year T-bond, what we can do is actually calculate it using the cap M. So our cap M is just our risk free rate plus our beta times our market risk premium. And in this case, we have the yield on a 30 year T-bond. So that's going to be our risk-free rate. So it's going to be 0 0.03 plus our beta of 1.16 times the market risk premium, which is 0 0.06. And I'll put that in percentage terms. Next, we have our cost of debt. And our cost of debt is just given as the yield on that debt if we have it. So 3.7%. Next, we need the market value of our equity, and market value of equity is just the market cap. So we know that this firm has seven plus billion shares, and they trade at $58. So let's get $58 times 7.18 billion shares, and that gives us a market cap of about $416 million. Next, let's get the market value of debt. Market value of debt is just given as 121.4 billion. So they have, that looks pretty good and their marginal tax rate is 35%. All right, now 
the weight of the debt is going to be calculated the same way we did in the previous problem. We're just going to take market value of debt divided by, we'll do the sum this time, sum of equity plus debt. And the market value of equity is just going to be market value of equity divided by the sum of debt plus equity. And let's get our whack. So our whack is just going to be product of our weight of our debt, so 22.6% times the cost of our debt times one minus our 35% marginal tax rate. We'll add to that the product of the weight of equity times the cost of equity. And that will give us a whack of 8.25%, which, like I said, typically tech companies will have a little higher weighted average cost of capital, although the big tech companies will often have a much lower whack than some of their smaller competitors. Oh. Now, let's summarize what we covered. First, we discussed why the cost of capital is important. It's used when we want to calculate the percentage cost to the firm to raise new capital. We can also use it to calculate the discount rate when we want to value the firm. We also discussed the weighted average cost of capital equation. The WAC, or weighted average cost of capital, weights the cost of equity and the cost of debt by the amounts of equity and debt that are issued by the firm and are currently outstanding. Finally, I mentioned several times that there are multiple ways to calculate all the components of the WAC, but the best values are those that are most forward-looking, meaning that they estimate the cost to the firm for issuing new debt or equity in the same weights that they were issued historically. With that said, I will wrap up here, and I'll look forward to seeing you on the next video.